Amidst the chaos of the First World War, the Deutschland U-boat stealthily navigated not just the treacherous war zones, but also made its way, remarkably, into America's harbors twice. A feat of German engineering, it wasn't just a formidable war machine, but also a symbol of audacity, challenging territorial waters and pushing boundaries. Join us as we journey through the remarkable story of the Deutschland, a submarine that not only redefined naval warfare, but also navigated the fine line between diplomacy and defiance. On the morning of July 9, 1916, as the day dawned and the fog cleared, onlookers along the shores of Chesapeake Bay in Virginia and Maryland witnessed a spectacle never before seen in the United States, a German submarine purposefully entering an American port. Stretching 213 feet in length and standing 30 feet tall, the Deutschland was the largest submarine ever built, designed solely to bypass the British naval blockade that was hampering subaqueous trade between Germany and the United States. Residents who had been tracking newspaper accounts about Germany's lethal U-boats in the initial years of the war assembled along the shore, watching the world's first merchant submarine unarmed and bearing the German flag navigate up the Chesapeake and into Baltimore. Reporters, newsreel staff, and thrill-seekers embarked on small crafts to get a closer view of the slow-moving Deutschland. Captain Paul Koenig, who was proficient in English, and his crew on the submarine's conning tower, answered questions about their groundbreaking voyage, his voice competing with the roar of Deutschland's engines. An unanticipated late-afternoon thunderstorm cleared the spectators and inquisitors, allowing the massive submarine a relatively peaceful end to its journey to Baltimore, and providing journalists adequate time to polish their stories for the evening newspapers. Even before its arrival, the Deutschland had become a massive media sensation. The evening edition of the Washington Times on July 9th dedicated its entire front page to the story, featuring headlines such as, Submarine Liners Arrives is now traversing Bay, German underwater vessel reaches Virginia, capes early today after eluding French and British warships, delivers vital chemical cargo to Baltimore. The Deutschland was laden with over 1,000 tons of dyes, which were desperately sought by U.S. textile manufacturers. Prior to the war, Germany dominated the worldwide supply of high-quality dyes used in textiles, with the United States being one of their main buyers. However, by 1916, due to the British shipping blockade and the exhaustion of pre-war dye stocks imported from Germany, the colors in American clothes, draperies, tablecloths, and other items had noticeably faded. U.S. textile producers eagerly awaited the arrival of the valuable cargo on board the Deutschland. After weeks of dodging British warships and maneuvering through turbulent waters, enduring indoor temperatures that sometimes spiked to 120 degrees, the Deutschland eventually docked peacefully at Locust Point in Baltimore Harbor. The crew was then accommodated in the spacious quarters of the German passenger ship Neckar, anchored next to the Deutschland. On the damp morning of July 10th, hundreds congregated outside the gates of the tall fence enclosing the dock, hoping for a glimpse of the Deutschland or its crew. Later that day, media personnel were invited to get a closer look at the scene, and soon enough, pictures of the Deutschland's crewmen smiling broadly and tipping their hats to the cameras, adorned newspapers nationwide. Baltimore extended a warm welcome to Koenig and his crew. The city was known to house one of the largest populations of Germans in the country, roughly 20% of its residents in 1914, having been a prime destination for German immigrants since the 1880s. A substantial number of Baltimore's public schools provided German language instruction. The city sustained a daily German language newspaper, and offered an extensive range of social clubs and activities tailored to its German-speaking residents. Koenig and other Deutschland crew members were treated as public celebrities, participating in press interviews, enjoying a meal with Mayor James H. Preston, receiving a visit from German Ambassador Johann Heinrich von Bernstorff, and attending banquets and other festive occasions arranged by Baltimore's German-American community. Koenig mirrored the warmth, only those familiar with American hospitality and American enthusiasm can imagine the genuine welcome we received everywhere, he told reporters. People were completely astounded. It was heartwarming to witness the honest and unrestricted joy Americans demonstrated concerning our voyage and safe arrival. Such was the appeal of the Deutschland that requests were made to secure a spot for its return journey to Germany. 
Approximately 200 members of Congress indicated their interest to visit the Deutschland intrigued by its political and technological novelty, but Koenig declined their requests for security reasons. Germany further celebrated the successful voyage by announcing plans to construct 25 more Deutschland-class submarines to traverse beneath the British blockade, aiming for not only the United States but also Spain and South America. In the United States, postcards featuring the Deutschland were produced in both English and German. Movie theaters in Baltimore, New York and other cities aired film clips of its arrival. Magazines such as Scientific American and Collier's highlighted articles about the technological wonders of the colossal submarine, while national newspaper editorials expressed mixed opinions. The Deutschland's feat is notable and if it is found to pay, it will doubtless be repeated. But the notion that it proves that the English blockade amounts to nothing, a German agent's assertion is delusional, as the Germans themselves are quite aware. New York Herald, July 12, 1916. The world will not withhold warm admiration for the initiative and daring that adapted this type of marine construction to the purposes of commerce, and the navigation that solved all of the problems of its record-breaking trip and caused the longest voyage ever made by a submarine to be a voyage of peace rather than war. In this brilliant exploit, the German merchant marine has matched the resourcefulness of the German Navy, and no higher commendation drawn from the analogies of the present war could be framed. St. Louis Post-Dispatch, July 10, 1916. The thrill incited by the arrival of the Deutschland, especially amongst the American media and Baltimore populace, was not reciprocated by the Allies, and the event stirred some discomfort in Washington, D.C. During the initial years of World War I, the United States and the Allies had distinctly differing opinions of the British blockade. The British were resolute in stopping the transportation of any resources that could enhance Germany's war efforts. Goods like food, coal, metals, weapons, and even cotton on American merchant ships were deemed contraband and ships found carrying these commodities had their cargo confiscated, irrespective of their final destination. Furthermore, the British placed limitations on what could be transported to Denmark, Norway, Sweden, and the Netherlands. Upon finding out these neutral European countries were channels for goods destined for Germany. The British also examined over 2,000 American vessels traveling between the United States and Canadian ports, seizing cargo worth millions. The blockade was supported by Britain's allies, France and Russia, as a tactic to reduce Germany's access to war materials and food. Not surprisingly, when the Allied nations, together with Japan, filed an official protest with the U.S. State Department to seize the Deutschland as a weapon of war, the U.S. response was lukewarm. As the submarine was purportedly owned by a private company, Deutsche Ozean Reiterei, and the crew had documents declaring they were German tradesmen instead of Navy personnel, the U.S. government found no grounds to seize it. However, representatives from the Navy and Treasury Departments were dispatched to inspect the submarine. Their report affirmed it was unarmed and couldn't feasibly be converted into an armed U-boat. Based on these findings, the Joint State and Navy Neutrality Board designated the Deutschland as a commercial vessel. But a significant condition was attached. The status of any Deutschland-like commercial submarine would be reassessed on each visit to a U.S. port. This allowed for possible policy shifts in the future, depending on German-American relations and Germany's war actions. In Washington, the British and French embassies aired their dissent not only to the resupplying of the submarine in Baltimore Harbor, but also to the U.S. government's decision to categorize the Deutschland as a merchant ship. The British promptly stressed that the Deutschland or any similar submarine would be treated as a military vessel by the Royal Navy, attacked on sight, and shown no leniency. Meanwhile, the Deutschland's dye stuff cargo was transported to a warehouse. The return cargo, 376 tons of nickel to strengthen Germany's arms industry's steel, and roughly 500 tons of rubber for gaskets, bushings, tires, and other war necessities was loaded into the vessel shortly after. Maintenance work was also performed. Engine components made from German steel were replaced with U.S. manufactured brass parts, as the German ones were inferior and prone to failure. The Deutschland topped off its tanks with high-quality American fuel to its maximum capacity, igniting another international protest, as the British and French contended that the surplus fuel could be used to refuel armed U-boats. 
rumors circulated that British and French vessels were anchored in international waters off the Chesapeake Bay, lying in wait for the Deutschland. Newspapers speculated that the submarine's voyage back to its home port of Bremen might not be as safe or straightforward as the journey to Baltimore. American fishing boats, whose owners sympathized with the British cause, were reportedly preparing enormous nets to ensnare the submarine. Sensing potential peril, Ambassador Bernsdorf requested a U.S. government escort for the Deutschland's three-mile journey to international waters, but the State Department declined his request. On August 1st, the Deutschland effortlessly detached from its mooring in Baltimore, accompanied by a flotilla of boats packed with reporters, photographers, and spectators, and smoothly sailed down the Patapsco River. By the next morning it had reached international waters, submerged beneath the surface, and embarked on its lengthy return journey to Germany. On August 25th, after an uneventful three weeks at sea, the Deutschland maneuvered its way into the Weser River. Thousands of spectators assembled along its banks to applaud the acclaimed submarine, which was decorated with various flags for the occasion, including the Star-Spangled Banner. Bremen's mayor and other high-ranking officials welcomed Koenig and his crew. Banquets, toasts, and tributes in honor of the heroic blockade runners followed. German print media, including Der Brümer and Lustig Blatter, published articles and caricatures praising the Deutschland's achievement. With escalating battlefield casualties and mounting food shortages providing little cause for optimism, the German populace was desperate for uplifting news, and the daring exploits of the Deutschland offered a flicker of fleeting hope. The idea for the Deutschland was conceived due to Germany's perilous circumstances resulting from the British blockade, which, as early as 1915, was significantly interfering with the import of critical raw materials needed for its war effort. German weapons manufacturers, for example, required resources such as nickel, saltpeter, iron ore, and coal to manufacture guns, artillery, and ammunition. Friedrich Krupp AG was the most prominent firm in this sector. Besides submarines, Krupp produced the majority of Germany's artillery, including the renowned Big Bertha, as well as various other armaments and war equipment, serving not just Germany but also its allies, the Austro-Hungarians and Ottomans. Upon the commencement of war in August 1914, Krupp had procured stocks of U.S. nickel to strengthen the steel used in U-boats, ships, artillery barrels, and other weaponry. However, the British blockade denied Krupp access to this invaluable metal. As a result, towards the end of 1915, the company directed its engineers to design a commercial submarine capable of navigating underneath the British fleet to acquire the nickel hoarded in America. Around the same time, Karl Helferich, Germany's finance minister and one of its leading financiers, suggested the same concept to the German Navy. Together with Alfred Lohmann, a Bremen-based businessman, Helferich devised a strategy not only to build the submarine but also to stage an elaborate deception making it seem as though the submarine was purely a private endeavor. To realize this, Helferich and Lohmann founded Deutsche Ozean Reederei, a civilian cover company. This was ostensibly owned by Norddeutscher Lloyd, a respected company that for over 30 years had transported immigrants from its Bremen base to Baltimore and handled shipments between Germany and the United States. However, behind the scenes, the Imperial German Navy's design office collaborated with Krupp, which would eventually build the Deutschland and be remunerated by the Navy. The ship's engines were designed for the German Navy's heavy cruisers, and the crew was selected from experienced U-boat personnel. In every aspect, the Deutschland was a product of the German Navy, concealed under the civilian guises of Deutsche Ozean Reederei and Norddeutscher Lloyd. With the costs for the construction of the Deutschland borne by the German government, Deutsche Ozean Reederei concentrated on warehousing, provisions, and other necessities in the United States. They employed the services of Paul Hilken, an MIT graduate and prominent figure in Baltimore's German-American community, who concurrently acted as a German spy while overseeing operations for the Norddeutsche Lloyd Steamship Company in 1915. Hilken orchestrated the docking, warehousing, and other facilities that the Deutschland would need during its sojourn in Baltimore. He also coordinated the transportation of raw materials to Baltimore that the Deutschland was tasked to transport back to Germany, with Krupp's previously purchased nickel taking precedence. In December 1915, the construction commenced for both the Deutschland and its sibling merchant submarine, the Bremen. 
Koenig was later chosen as the Deutschland's commander due to his fluency in English, established captainship, and experience in navigating the route to Baltimore during his stint with Norddeutscher Lloyd. Like the majority of the crew, Koenig was part of the German Navy, but to perpetuate the facade of the Deutschland being strictly a merchant vessel, all crew members were issued documents certifying their status as merchant sailors. In truth, the Deutschland was an unarmed U-boat of the Imperial German Navy, manned by a crew from the same navy. Owing to the success of the Deutschland's maiden voyage, it delivered the urgently needed nickel to Krupp and rubber to other German companies. The large submarine set sail from Bremen for the second time on October 1, 1916, this time charting a course for New London, Connecticut, as this destination would cut approximately a week from the round trip. The cargo for this voyage, apart from dyes, consisted of German pharmaceuticals, diamonds, and other precious gemstones and securities, all aimed at acquiring American goods. Like the dyes, the German pharmaceuticals had a considerable market in the United States, which had now become inaccessible due to the British blockade. Following a three-day ordeal in the Atlantic storm, the Deutschland finally docked in New London on November 8. However, the situation didn't proceed as smoothly as in Baltimore. One significant disruption was the unexpected arrival of U-53 at the naval station in Newport, Rhode Island, on October 7. The sudden appearance of the U-boat at the entrance of Narragansett Bay exposed the U.S. Navy's susceptibility to submarines at one of its major bases. After a courteously brief six-hour visit, the U-53 departed Newport and went on to sink six Allied ships over the subsequent six days while patrolling the Atlantic. Under the Sussex Pledge, which Germany made in May 1916 to mollify the United States following the unanticipated sinking of a French passenger ferry by a German submarine, Germany had vowed that its U-boats would grant sufficient time for merchant ships to allow crews and passengers to escape on lifeboats before sinking them. The onus was then on the United States to send ships to rescue those stranded at sea. These attacks further swayed public sentiment against Germany, and American business tycoons began fearing that U-boats would soon endanger all shipping along the East Coast. The unsettling U-53 incident had already put a damper on the Deutschland second expedition, and public sentiment did not improve. In New London, an absolute media embargo was enforced at the dock where the Deutschland was stationed. The submarine was hidden from sight with no opportunity for interaction with its crew. Yet again, naval inspectors were dispatched to verify that the Deutschland was unarmed. However, this team of inspectors reached a notably negative verdict. They asserted that the Deutschland could be effortlessly converted into a surface raider or a mine-laying submarine, and could be outfitted with torpedoes. They also noted that the large cargo holds could allow the Deutschland to function as a submarine tender providing fuel and replacement parts to other U-boats. Just after midnight on November 17th, the Deutschland left New London carrying a cargo of nickel, rubber, tin, and silver. As it was being navigated out to sea by the T.A. Scott Jr. tugboat, the tug veered suddenly into its path and crashed into the massive submarine. The tugboat instantly sank, taking the lives of all five crew members. The Deutschland returned to New London for repairs. Before long, claims totaling over $200,000 were filed against its owners. Even though a trial was scheduled for December 18th, Koenig received permission to depart, and the Deutschland embarked on its journey home on November 21st. The second voyage did not result in any positive PR, so the submarine and its crew were greeted by no dignitaries, cheering crowds, or celebratory feasts upon their return to Bremen. While the Deutschland completed two successful trips ferrying goods to and from the United States, changing circumstances in Germany were about to shift its fate. Germany started rationing bread in January 1915. The remainder of the year saw a rise in prices for staple foods like bread, milk, meat, and other necessities. Unsurprisingly, shortages of these goods resulted in civil disturbances. As more items, including fats, flour, and potatoes were rationed the next year, Food-related civil disturbances erupted in cities across Germany. On the battlefield, German soldiers suffered heavy losses at places like the Somme and Verdun, with scant evidence of any military or political advances over the Allies. Germany's situation was becoming increasingly dire. 
As 1916 wore on, the worsening conditions in Germany brought the concept of unrestricted submarine warfare back to the forefront of the German government's considerations. With a significantly larger U-boat fleet than in 1915, the Germans aimed to force Britain to capitulate by cutting off the supply chains it depended on from the United States and other places. Sanctioned by Kaiser Wilhelm II, Germany proclaimed that its unrestricted submarine onslaught would recommence on February 1, 1917. In December 1916, the German administration decreed that all submarines belonging to the Deutschland class be transferred to the German Navy's control for conversion into U-cruisers, amplified U-boats designed to withstand extended periods at sea. On February 27, 1917, the Deutschland, now dubbed U-155, was transported to the North Sea Naval Base in Wilhelmshaven, where its modification into a U-cruiser began. The interior was reconfigured to house a larger crew and a more substantial ammunition reserve, and the original narrow walkway from the conning tower was substituted with a wider, elevated deck. Two 150mm deck guns were installed on the new deck, and six torpedo tubes, all recycled from the outdated battleship Zaringen, were fitted at the bow and stern of the guns. However, the refit endowed U-155 with a pair of nautical drawbacks. Firstly, its external torpedo tubes were continuously exposed to seawater, amplifying maintenance needs and making them prone to mechanical breakdowns, with the submarine required to surface to reload them. Secondly, it was slow. The Deutschland could only reach about 10 knots on the surface and was significantly slower when submerged. It couldn't chase fast ships, and its slow submersion speed left it highly vulnerable to depth charges and surface gunfire from Allied vessels. Hence, the captain of Deutschland had to exercise extra discretion in his attack strategies. Upon the Deutschland's metamorphosis into a U-cruiser, Koenig returned to the Navy to work in its personnel office, assigning merchant sailors for U-boat service. Two of Deutschland's officers stayed with U-155, serving under its new captain Karl Moisel, who had undergone U-boat commander training and previously served as a watch commander. A fresh crew was recruited for U-155, and following a sequence of sea trials, it left Kiel for patrol in the Azores on May 23, 1917. Just one day into the journey, one of U-155's compressors broke down and needed repair. This was the first in a string of mechanical issues that beset the U-boat during its maiden patrol, Nevertheless, Musel persisted as his mechanics resolved the technical problems by salvaging parts and utilizing the onboard machine shop. To make up for the speed while optimizing the firepower of his deck guns, Musel, using the naval strategy of crossing the T, would surface U-155 in the trajectory of an approaching ship to aim both of his deck guns at the target. He speculated that no ship would dare to collide with the large submarine. None did. Moisel's patrol guided him along the Norwegian coast around the northern tip of Ireland and then down to the Azores. From May 23 to August 8, U-155 sank or damaged 21 ships, primarily by utilizing its 150mm deck-mounted guns to force them to stop and then boarding them to plant charges. Only once did U-155 use its torpedoes to sink a ship. However, combat exposed additional issues with the Deutschland's conversion. Many of its torpedoes were damaged due to improper storage and jostling in stormy seas. The heavy usage of the large deck guns caused them to loosen from their mountings, and their traversing gears wore out, subsequently affecting their accuracy. U-155 took the subsequent month to return to Kiel, docking on September 7. It was quickly sent to the shipyards for repairs, and Moselle was reassigned to another U-boat. Commander Eric Eckelman took over the helm of U-155, marking his first combat assignment. After being fitted with new deck guns and an internal torpedo room and undergoing a thorough overhaul, U-155 embarked on a fresh series of sea trials in December 1917. On January 14, 1918, it once more charted a course south of the Azores, with the mission to intercept ships traveling to and from the Mediterranean Sea via the Straits of Gibraltar. Both en route and at the station, Eckelman had trouble finding suitable targets as the Allies had started using defensive convoys to reduce damage to their merchant ship fleet. As a result, Eckelman targeted sailboats, sinking a total of 17. 
After its return to Kiel on May 4, 1918, U-155 underwent a three-month overhaul and was fitted with mine-laying equipment. A new captain, Ferdinand Stutt, was appointed who, like Eckelman, was inexperienced with U-boats. On August 11th, U-155 left Kiel for what would be its final patrol, covering the eastern seaboard from Canada to New York City. Before being summoned home with the rest of the U-boat fleet on October 21st, Stutt managed to sink just four fishing vessels and an additional four ships. U-155 returned to Kiel on November 14th, a mere three days after the armistice was signed. The saga of Deutschland U-155 did not end quickly or quietly with the end of World War I. As per the terms of the armistice, the German Navy was given 14 days to surrender all of its submarines to the Allies. Thus, on November 24, 1918, the remaining operational German U-boats surrendered to British Rear Admiral Reginald Tyrwhitt, the commander of the Harwich Force, which had aided in the U-boat hunt and participated in the blockade against Germany during the war. As observed by Sir Eric Geddes, the First Lord of the Admiralty, from the bridge of one of Tierwitz's destroyers, the remaining 28 German U-boats, led by U-155, were handed over to the Royal Navy. The British did not miss any opportunity to display the captured U-boats as war trophies. Five of them, including Deutschland, were moved from Harwich to London. On December 14th, the formidable Deutschland anchored at St. Catherine's Dock near Tower Bridge, was open to the public, attracting hundreds of spectators eager to get a glimpse inside. Upon its return to Harwich at the beginning of 1919, Deutschland was bought by financier Horatio Bottomley, a former member of parliament and owner of the patriotic publication, John Bull. The submarine was displayed across England as a marketing gimmick to encourage the sale of over 100,000 pounds in victory bonds, with profits from admissions and souvenir sales assigned to the King George's Fund for Sailors, a charity established in 1917. It was reported that more than 150,000 people saw Deutschland during its exhibition at various English harbors from May 1919 to September 1920. However, the entire venture turned out to be a fraudulent scheme masterminded by Bottomley, who was arrested and convicted in 1922 for fraud related to the acquisition and commercial exploitation of Deutschland, and for personal gain from the proceeds of the victory bonds. Deutschland's final chapter was marked with tragedy. In June 1921, it was moved to Birkenhead near Liverpool for disassembly. A disastrous explosion ripped through its engine room three months later during its dismantling, resulting in the death of five young apprentices and severe injury to another as the torches they were using ignited tanks of hydrogen gas in their workspace. Shortly after this incident, the remaining parts of the submarine were sold as scrap. Without a doubt, Deutschland was the most famous German U-boat of the First World War. It served as a symbol of German resolve and the inventive prowess of the German Navy and industry. Amid the crippling effects of the British naval blockade, Germany saw merchant submarines as a potential solution. However, in their desperation, the Germans disregarded obvious facts, that the Deutschland-class submarines were too small, too slow, and too few to have a substantial impact on the war's outcome. In the end, Deutschland was as much a failure as it was celebrated. Thanks for watching. Remember to like and subscribe. See you soon.